have or are in need of prayer, you can either, if you're here at the church, put your name in here personally, get with me, Pastor Woody or me, or mail it in to the address that uh, is either on the screen or you can get off the website. This isn't a prayer request, request book per se. There's not only names in here. There's not prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, we'd be happy to, to receive it and pray over it. And if you'll send in your address... Uh, Pastor Woody will send you a decal that says Rockin' Country Church is praying for me. And we are. We pray over this book multiple, multiple times a week. Yesterday we were in here doing RCC TV. We prayed over it. Um, Brent has made a habit of during the trail life with the boys we pray over it. And of course most of us pray over it at home. So if Ben, you'll remove your hats again. Dear Lord, we thank you again for allowing us to come and lift up these names, Lord. We pray that you will fulfill whatever needs they may have and you will comfort them in whatever way they need to be comforted. We ask you to lift up Pastor Woody today, that you will fill him with the Spirit and allow him to deliver the message that you have given him. We ask you to be with our offerings and our tithes, Lord, and you'll allow us to use them in the way that you call us to use them. Please touch the people in the community, the ones who know you, the ones who don't know you. We just ask that you will lift up the congregations and the pastors in this area and, and ensure that they do preach the Bible at your word. And we just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together like this to lift you up, to praise you, to worship you, and to get your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. What do we have? Oh. Good morning, Rockin' Country Church. Joey, I got a question for you. Has anybody ever said you look like Loretta Lynn? Yes. Because you certainly look like Loretta Lynn. I'll tell you what. And I love Loretta Lynn. But uh, I looked up there and I, thought, I told Terry, I says, she looks just like Loretta Lynn. And it's awesome. And you sing like her too. So we were certainly blessed and look forward to uh, you continuing blessing us here at the end of our service today. I've got a couple of announcements I need to share with you. Uh, first of all, you know that on our ministries, we support a church down in uh, Mexico. And I've got a letter from him. And it happens to be in English and in Spanish. So for our, our uh, visitors here who speak Spanish, you're more than welcome. The couple of things I want to, I'm not going to read you the whole letter, but it will be available for your viewing if you would like. I'll put it on our bulletin in our, in our room back there. But this is, uh, this is kind of what started us off with uh, this particular guy. I'm just going to give you a quick brief uh, story. Um, he came up here to work with Raul. Raul is a master plumber. He builds apartments and whatever, etc. cetera. Uh, and this guy came up here from Mexico <coughs> to uh, to work and to make some money and uh, take that money back and build some walls and a roof for his church. That was the reason he was here to work, so he could build some walls and a roof for his church. Well, God has certainly blessed him over and over and over again. And I'm going to read you this little part of his letter here. It says, now we can have, uh, let me back up a little bit. We were offered a bigger house <coughs> so that it was more economical, which was an answer to our prayers. Now we can have our services under a roof, Amen. under a roof, okay, and a room for the children. It has a big patio for evangelistic events and uh, a better situated, and it is better situated in San Nicolas. Uh, his wife just had a baby. Uh, there were some issues there. Everything came out good. The wife is great. The baby's great. The husband is great. God is great. On and on and on and on. I'm going to put this back there, but I want you to take a moment and just take a look. I know you can't see it from there, but I want you to take a look and see this blessing that God has blessed them with, which is this brand new baby. This is a, this is a young guy about... 26, 28 years old, something like that, I think. Huh? 22 years old. 22 years old, and God has called him into the ministry, and, and he is doing everything he possibly can in order to uh, do God's work down in, this, in central Mexico down there. And so he is on our list back there. So whenever you look at your, uh, your uh, handout, uh, you will see on there that you can support that ministry if you so desire. Speaking of supporting uh, the ministry, of course, uh, Joy and Cotton have a product table out there. So if, you, if the Lord leads you or you want some of that good-looking women's stuff, okay, please support them in that. Uh, that is how they do their ministry. Uh, I do have that album that is out there, and I still play that album uh, 
years ago whenever you gave it to me or sent it to me. I love that song. I love the, the music. I love what you sang today. It's such a blessing. Uh, we also have our love offering ba uh, basket, of course, out here. So if the Lord leads you to give in that, just just uh, drop something into the uh, basket there, and, and uh, you'll certainly bless them, okay? A uh, couple other things real quick that I want to, oh, I've got to share with you some of our other things that are going on that are coming up this next week. <clears throat> I know last week I turned in the names to all those volunteers. We had 15 volunteers sign up to help with Christmas for Kids. Uh, Rachel made known to me that if you still want to help and you didn't get your name on that list, that if you will get it to me, I will get it to her, and you can be admitted into the junior high school to uh, help with the Christmas for Kids that is coming up. And the schedule for that is, you might want to write this down. Now, we got a busy weekend coming up, okay? So don't plan anything else but church, all right? Amen. Friday night at 5 o'clock, we're going to meet at Hillcrest, uh, Hillcrest Baptist Church. We're going to gather up all the gifts and all the food and all that stuff, and we're going to take it over to the junior high, and we're going to set up games at 630. So our church is to supply two games. Terry already knows what they are, and so uh, we've got the stuff. Uh, maybe Brent has some suggestions, too, and get with him. But anyway, uh, at 630, we're going to go to the junior high school and set up the, uh, the games. This is going to be back uh, before COVID. What we did is, is we actually had the, we have the use of the gymnasium in the junior high. And we're going to be able to be in there with the kids doing different things while the parents are out front receiving the gifts and the presents and the food and all that kind of stuff. All right. So we need those volunteers to help inside the church and the volunteers to help with the distribution of food and gifts, etc. Rachel will take care of all that as far as the scheduling as to where you need to be. But that will be the setup uh, in the gym will be at 630 on Saturday morning. They're asking that you be there around 845 at the junior high school, 845. And it starts promptly, promptly, promptly at 10 a.m. And uh Anyway, they've got it all figured out, set up, so you don't have to worry about doing anything except showing up and saying, where do you need me? All right? That's how simple it is. Uh, there will be a luncheon for all the volunteers afterwards. Uh, it is scheduled for, I think, 12, because this will be over with right about 12 o'clock. It, it doesn't last but a couple hours. And uh, maybe it's 12.30 that they have the luncheon schedule. Anyway, and it will be at the... Um, Senior Citizen Center there on Dallas Street, or I think it's 9th Avenue, right off of 9th Avenue over in downtown Kemp. All right? So that takes care of all that. Something else going on Saturday that if you can attend, and I know you're going to say, oh, my gosh, more stuff. Well, you know what? God gives us energy. This is the time of year to just get out there and do. You can rest in January. Okay? So... Most of you know, maybe not all of you do, Miss Evelyn passed away, all right, uh, a, little, a little while back. Uh, Chris and I are going to meet with David and her daughter Monday, tomorrow night, at uh, between 5 and 5.30, and get the order of service lined out. Her, at her, David's request, her husband's request, he, wants to, he wanted to do it this weekend, but I said we have too much going on with Thanksgiving, etc., uh, we're going to do her memorial service next Saturday at 3 o'clock. Now, if you can make that dinner, that's all fine. For the volunteers, that's all fine. If you can't, ladies, if uh, we can come up with some food items, et cetera, et cetera, like we did with George, and uh, have a lunch in here. I do not have a number yet. I do not know what. I, I'll know this tomorrow night after I meet with the family, all right? Uh, but let's plan on a, uh, if we have to order in, let's order in whatever we need to do in order to uh, have a dinner for the family next Saturday, okay? Oh, yeah, this coming Saturday, not next, yeah, this coming Saturday, which is the third, which is the third, all right? So, uh, Miss Evelyn has gone to be with the Lord. She is healed. Uh, just a, a brief uh, as to what was going on. Uh, Dave brought her a couple of times because she was uh, in the stages of dementia and her health was not very good, etc., as we know, and it has been that way for some time. But she wanted to come to church. 
she didn't forget about coming to church. And she loved her church. In other words, she loved you. And uh, so she wanted to be here. And uh, certainly we will dearly miss her. And uh, we look forward to seeing her again someday. Okay? Uh, but anyway, that's uh, kind of what we have planned, or what we need to plan for that, if you will. Um, oh, I have to apologize to all those who came out Friday morning after especially our meeting last week when I said, be sure and be here Friday morning to help put up decorations, okay? <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. Uh, I have no excuse. I can tell you what happened, but I have no excuse because there is no excuse. Uh, she was coming in Friday. I had to clean the house, <laughs> Okay. I had to make the bed. I had to put the toilet seat down. You know, I had to do all this stuff. And then she comes home. She goes, my gosh, this house is filthy. Look at this. Look at that. I, I, what, what do I do, you know? So anyway, I failed at that too. But, uh, uh, and then, of course, our kids came over uh, yesterday. So we had to get ready for Thanksgiving. And that's just what happened. I'm not saying it's an excuse, brother. I should have been here. Okay, so please forgive me. And if you don't, well, then you just don't. That's on you, all right? <laughs> I, I will help tape down. Hey, I've done it before and put it all back up. And so it's no big deal. Um, but anyway, I uh, failed to be here, and I apologize for that. And to be honest with you, I didn't even think about it. I had so many things going on, it never crossed my mind. Well, I'm fixing to go to that, Cotton, <laughs> because I am trying to get that grace and that forgiveness, okay? <laughs> you better believe it. I know you do. So, so the, I just want to say that it is gorgeous. It is beautiful. And thank you, thank you, thank you. All those who, who put forth the effort, thank you, thank you, thank you. You did a wonderful job again, again. So, again, I apologize, but... Uh, I mean, what do you need me for? Look at what y'all did. Y'all did a great job, right? Oh, you need me to put it up. I got you. All right. I'll be here. Took it up and put it back down. Okay. Well, good. Well, see, I, that's why he's our associate pastor. He needs to learn how to do all this stuff. Okay, when nobody else is around, he has to do it himself, right? So that's part of his training. <laughs> anyway, I apologize. I really, really do. And, uh, and y'all did a certainly a wonderful, wonderful job. It is absolutely beautiful. I came in to get chairs and tables for our family deal. And uh, it was just like, wow. No, well... As I was driving up here, I went, uh-oh, <laughs> because I, I had so much going on, I just, it did not even cross my mind Friday morning, okay, and I apologize, but anyway, all right, forgive me or not, that's up to you, but uh, God's already forgiven me, all right, so our scripture for today, and uh, we have talked about this, uh, we don't have any kiddos, do we? No, we don't, all right, well, Bobby's not even here, our mascot, okay, well, good. We're going to talk about family today, but um, a little while back, before I went to Mexico, I talked to you about John 3, verse 7. This is probably the most important scripture, which all the scripture is important, no doubt, but probably one of the most important scriptures in scripture. Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born again. He didn't say it'd be a good idea. He didn't say, well, you ought to think about it. He said, you must be born again. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, this week, we're going to talk about John 1, um, John 3, 1 through 10. John 3, 1 through 10. You can take this, this section, this, this communication, this uh, teaching of Nicobit to Nicodemus from Jesus, you can take it in two different parts. The first part is his conversation with Nicodemus. The second part is Jesus explaining to Nicodemus 
what God's plan is for you and me and how it is, how it is done, how it works. But, at, but one through 10, he is telling Nicodemus in verse seven, he says, you must be born again. Very, 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 very important for us to realize what being born again is. Oh, I know what being born again is. It means going to church and being happy and hearing a good message and getting dunked in the water, right? Getting baptized. No, it's not. Now, I, from a preacher, you might not think that this is a good thing to say, but you don't have to go to church. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to pray. But Jesus says you must be born again. Now, I want to counter all that that I just said. You come to church to fellowship with one another with like believers, right? All right, you pray because that's the only one that can supply all your needs according to the riches and glories in Christ Jesus, right? Okay? You come to church because you need to come to church. Oh, well, I just watch it online. Well, you can do that. But you miss out. You miss out. What do you mean I miss out? You know, I, I get the word, I, I hear the message, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You miss out on the fellowship. And you know what? What's more is everybody else misses out on you. What? Yeah, they miss out on you. They miss out on you being here. It is important that Terry is here. She's been in, in Oregon for a month. It's important that, I mean, my house is clean now. But, but it's important that Terry is in my life. It's important that Chris is in my life. It's a, Beverly and Ted have gone through sickness after sickness after sickness for, for a long time. It is important that they be here. Why? Because we love them and we want to fellowship with them. We want to be a part of them and we want them to be a part of us. You can't do that on TV. Now, I used to also do the UA Network. That's where I started four years ago on doing my chapter by chapter, verse by verse Bible study. I've been doing Bible study for about 18 years now. But I did the UA Network for two years, and then I thought to myself, why do I need to pay for this when I can set it up? And we actually have a, a uh, studio upstairs now. And, and we record and every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on the uh, YouTube channel. We have a new chapter by chapter, verse by verse Bible study. And it's been going for three years. Going, yeah, three years. And uh, they just recorded yesterday for the month of December. By the way, by the way, we do a testimony uh, on the fifth Sunday of every month. Uh, no, on the fifth Sunday of every month. It has a fifth Sunday. Yeah, I knew I'd say it somehow. And uh, we need some more testimonies. So I know this is not a, just a quick drive, but if you go to Mesquite, it's just another hour away, right? So... Uh, we need some more testimonies, Cotton. If you want to uh, record your testimony, there's a man to talk to, and we would love to do it. And then on a fifth Sunday, whichever one you fall on, it will be aired, and it'll go out all over the world. So that wasn't part of my teaching today, but anyway, uh, we need those testimonies, okay? Um, and if anybody else feels as though they need a testimony, Janet, Janet gave hers. If anybody else feels as though they can give their testimony, um, I was thinking to say, whatever his name is over there, Barry, Barry is giving his. Yeah, so we welcome you. Just get with Chris and we'll get that worked out, okay? We need these testimonies. Why? What does it do? It, it tells other people just exactly what your song said earlier. What in the world do you, are you thinking when you think God can't save you if he would save this guy? I love it where Paul says over in, uh, in chapter 7 of uh, the book of Romans, he says, what a wretched man I am that I've, I've lived this life of sin and this, this life of not following Christ, and all of a sudden, you know, Christ changed him, and look what God has done to him now, or did to him then. You know, he wrote more than half of the New Testament. God can use you. You just got to let him use you. That's how simple it is. And your testimony will be used by God to touch other lives. Don't think it won't, because it will. So it's very, very, very important that we understand Jesus tells us this specific statement, and he tells a teacher, a Pharisee of Pharisees, one of the very smart people of, of Scripture, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, what? I don't understand. 
There's a reason he didn't understand. And we're going to talk about that today, okay? All right. So much for my introduction. So now I'm going to do my introduction, all right? <laughs> we just celebrated Thanksgiving. I just told you that we celebrated ours last night, and it was great. We had 18 or 19 there. Yeah, 18, 19 there. Had a great, great time. Anyway, missed some, but some people were there. Everyone had their fill of fine food. Uh, Thursday, hopefully you had your fill of fine food. I'm going to get some more of that fine food today, and I'm good with that. I love leftovers. There you go, and that's all right. There you go. And I know we did, we did, but more and more importantly, we had a chance to fellowship. Fellowship. That's what it's all about. Every time Jesus sat with his guys, if you will, or almost every time he sat with his guys, they ate. I like that kind of Jesus because I like to eat, right? They fellowshiped with one another. And it's a good thing, but it also can be a sad thing. It's a good thing to fellowship and be with family and friends, but it can be a sad thing. Why? Because they had to go home. They had to go home last night. It won't be until Christmas till I see them all again. We discussed that kind of extensively yesterday. You know, we get together twice a year. Why is that? Now, we see individually, individual times, et cetera, et cetera, but we only come together as this core group, if you will, twice a year. And that saddens me. Now, you know, recently, and I just mentioned it a minute ago, uh, Miss Evelyn passed away. Last week, we celebrated George's homecoming. He passed away. And we've had others pass away in the, uh, from this church. In the 11 years that we've been in existence, we've had several people that have passed away. Of course, everybody has. But see, we know something that some other people don't know. We know something that other people wonder about. We don't worry about not seeing them again because we know we're going to see them again. We know we're going to see them again. That's why we celebrate their homecoming, and we know that we're going to have a homecoming too at some point in time. We're sad because we have suffered a great loss in our life, but we also rejoice. We also rejoice because we know where they're at. We know that they're no longer sick, they're no longer hurting, they're no longer in pain. And we know and we rejoice because we know we're going to see them again. And they're going to be completely healthy. George is going to grab Margot and they're going to go swinging around the dance floor one more time. It's going to be a good thing. So we rejoice in that. We rejoice in that. Our hearts are saddened at the time, but we rejoice in knowing that we will see them again. You see, we have this little secret. Shh, don't tell nobody. Don't let anybody in on it, Okay. We have this little secret that we have a Savior. And that Savior promises us that if we're good, we'll get to go to heaven, right? No. <laughs> not if you're good. Jesus says there is no one good, not one. No one's good except God himself. Paul says there is no one good. No, not one. There is none righteous, none whatsoever. It doesn't matter how good you are. That's not what it's based on. It's not based on your goodness. You can be the gooderest of all gooders. But it's not based on that. See, we have this secret. The churches, the religions of the world try to tell you, you got to be good. You got to do right. You got to quit doing this. You got to quit doing that. You got to please God by being good. But no one's good, no, not one. Jesus says only God is good. So we fall short, right? Because we're not to compare ourselves with each other. 
well, I'm certainly gooder than him. It doesn't matter. There's somebody gooder than me. Right? So it can't be based on your gooderness. It has to be based on something much better. And it is. You see, we know that we will see George and Evelyn again and others in eternity, so we rejoice. A lot of the world says, well, I don't believe that stuff. And a lot of religions, as a matter of fact, all the other religions of the world other than Christianity says you must be good enough. Do you realize that? All other religions in the world said you've got to be good to get in the favor of God and to go to heaven. All of them. Except Christianity. Christianity says you're not good enough. Well, that ain't no fun. I want to be good. Well, you can be good. You can be great in the eyes of God. But it's not based on you. Because you're not good enough. Well, that's depressing as all get out. That's not good news. The good news is, is we have a Savior. And he is the good news, not us. Because our gooderness is not good enough. We have a secret. Don't tell anybody. Let's keep it to ourselves, right? You know why? Because if we don't, if we keep it to ourselves, then those other people won't be able to get in. You know, those other people that we're gooder than? You know, all those other people that are just not as religious and righteous as we are. All those other people that, oh, God, do they mess up. Why would they do such a thing? Why would they live such a life when they could live a life like mine? You don't want to live my life. I think Cotton can attest to that as well. Not to my life, but to his life. You see, we look back at our lives. We don't look at our, as Christians, we don't look back at our lives to see how bad we were. We look back on our lives to see how far we've come. Okay? We can't change the past. The past is what it is. But we can change today, and we can certainly change tomorrow. But don't tell nobody. Because those other people may get in. You don't want to be those other people. I mean, they're not good people. So who are these other people? You mean my neighbors, as Jesus says? Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anybody other than me. And Jesus tells us, he says, love your neighbors as I have loved them, John 13, 34. Love your neighbors as I have loved them. And as you would have me love you. We can't do that. We can't do that. Do you love everybody you know? No, I don't. Not in the flesh, I don't. But in the spirit, I do. I do. I literally do. We pray for people we don't even like. We pray for people we don't want to be around. Now, we say... We don't want to be around them, not because they're bad people. We don't be around them because we have a bad relationship, if you will. And we don't need that fellowship with people who, in a sense, affect our relationships with God. Who hurt our walk, if you will, because of the bad history that we have with each other. And I'm sure there's people who do not want to have a fellowship with me. And that's okay. We love them from afar, and they love us from afar. But we do have to love them, because Jesus commands us to do that. So we have to do that. But who are all these other people out there? Well, what about doctors and lawyers? Anybody know a lawyer that they love? (laughs) If it's your son or daughter, maybe so. But there, I'm sure, will be lawyers in heaven, I think. Of course, I'm not their judge, but anyway. What about carpenters and plumbers? I hope you love carpenters. And Raul says he hopes you love plumbers. What about truck drivers and pilots, nurses and teachers, secretaries and homemakers, coaches and players, friends of my brother-in-law's, uh, sister-in-law's aunt, uncle, twice removed? 
the checker at Walmart, your barber, your hairdresser. Aren't these just good, hardworking people in our lives? Sure they are. People just like you, me and you. So why won't we share the good news, the secret that we have with them? Because somebody wants them to be there. It may not be you, may not be me, but somebody wants somebody. Somebody actually wants everybody to be there. That's God. His will is, is that none shall perish, no, not one. So why don't we share with them? After all, somebody shared it with you at one point in your life, right? Sure they did. Somebody shared the gospel with you at one point in their life. May not have changed you then, but the seed was planted and that seed manifested and here you are today. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. He is the only Savior. Other religions may think this or that and the other. It doesn't matter. History, theology, doctrine, God says Jesus is our Savior and the only Savior. The only Savior that can save you from you. You can't save you. You can't save anybody else. Jesus is the only one that saves. Our Savior tells us there is one thing we must do to please God. And in pleasing God, we and our neighbors get to live with God and be with God in heaven for eternity at some point in time. Just like George, just like Miss Evelyn, just like others, their time came. And it was time for them to go and be with the Lord. And that's where they're at. That's what we believe. That's what we stand on. We base our faith on the promises to Christ from God the Father, which was that there you shall not see decay, you shall not remain in the grave, but you shall be resurrected, and the promise is for us as well. And you shall spend eternity in heaven. Eternity in heaven. Our time will come. It will come at some point in time. In John 3 and 7, Again, probably the most important scripture in our Christian walk is that you must be born again. And being born again is not being baptized in that water over there. Because I've done that to people who said, well, yeah, I've been dunked in every church you've ever been in. I've been baptized a hundred times. But you're still not clean on the inside. So it has nothing to do with the flesh, and Jesus is going to explain this to us. So what does being born again entail? What does it take to be born again? Well, I'm glad you asked. Today we're going to look at John 3, starting at verse 1 through verse 10. Next week we will look at 11 through 21. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Ooh, by night. Must be a secret, right? Well, actually, that is the purpose of him coming at night. Some believe that, oh, well, it's the darkness of his sin is what the representation of the night is. No, that's not true. Well, it'll give him a little bit of time one-on-one with Jesus. That's not true. Jesus always stops for anyone who calls his name and spends time with them. He'll do that for you right now. He came at night because of his shame that somebody might see him talking to the Savior. This is representative of people who are saying, oh yeah, I know all about church. I know about the Bible. I know about this. I know that. But do they know Jesus? 
No, they don't know Jesus. Why? Because they don't spend time with Jesus. They don't profess among, in the public, among other people. They don't show other people the Jesus that lives in them. Oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my religion to myself. Don't talk about politics or religion. Friend, I'll talk about politics and religions anytime. And every time I can. I don't want anybody to know that I'm one of those people. They may think that I'm one of those people. I am a child of the Most High God, and I am very, very, very proud of it. Matter of fact, I am humbled immensely by it. I've told you many times, and I still attest to this, why would God save me? Because he loves me, and that's the only reason it could be. Because there's nothing I've ever done that would have pleased God in my life that I know of other than saying, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. Surrendering myself to him. Nicodemus came by night and said to him, Rabbi, I love this part right here. Now, this is a smart guy, okay? This is a really, really, really smart guy who supposedly knows the Jewish law. Matter of fact, he does know the Jewish law. He is probably, according to Scripture, probably one of the most intelligent Pharisees of the time. And he says, we know that you are a teacher that has come from God. No one can do the things that you do unless God is with him. This is very, very important to understand. You, Jesus tells us over in uh, John 15, 5, he says, you can do nothing without me. And exactly what Jesus is saying there is that, and he goes on to explain it even more in a little bit, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven and you cannot know the kingdom of heaven and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you have him. So let's look at, you cannot see. We're going to look at that in just a second. But what he's telling Nicodemus is, he says, you think you know everything according to the law, and you do, but you have no idea who God the Father is. You have no idea who you're speaking to, and you know, have no idea of the power of the Spirit that will come and live within you. You don't have a clue, buddy. Paul even tells us about this over in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it is. Um, it's in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to get to it in just a second. Nicodemus came to Jesus and he says, we know you're from God. Well, that ought to put a, you know, a light ought to go off or something. We know you're from God. Because nobody can do the things that you're doing unless they, God is with him. But yet, I don't want anybody to see me talking to a man of God. I don't want anybody to know that I'm actually conversing with you or asking you a question. Wait a minute, did he ask him a question? Well, let's look at verse 3 here. Verse 3, Jesus answered him. What do you mean Jesus answered him? If you look back up in verse 2, there's no question there. I'm going to read verse 2 again. This man came to Jesus by night and said, him, said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. There's not a question there. Because Jesus didn't answer the question, a verbal question from him in the physical. Jesus knew his heart. Just like he knows your heart and he knows my heart. Jesus knew his heart. He knew the true question that Nicodemus had in his soul, in his very soul. He knew it, he, that he had it in his mind. He knew that he had it in his heart. So Jesus answered him. Jesus answered his spirit. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So in other words, what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is, is, hey, you're one of the really smart people. You're supposed to know everything. And you're, you're the teacher of all, all the people who are supposed to be following God. But yet you cannot even see the kingdom of God. You don't have a clue as to what it's all about. Because we, see, this is our secret. We know what it's all about, right? Shh, don't tell nobody. Let's keep it our secret. 
Jesus says, no, I'm going to share it with you. But you've got to understand it. You've got to receive it. You've got to see it. But you can't do it unless you're born again. I've talked to people I don't know how many times. Oh, no, I don't go to church. Yeah, I've read the Bible. Yeah, I know what it says. Yeah, I believe this. I believe that. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know a thing. You're ignorant, not meaning it disrespectfully. Ignorant means lack of knowledge. It does not mean that you're a stupid person. It means you have a lack of knowledge. He says you are ignorant of the facts of God. You cannot know God. You cannot see God. You cannot understand God unless you have God in you. Now, we know and we believe that there's a, there's a God with, a, with three deities. It's the triune God. It's the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was walking the earth, the Holy Spirit was not among the people because God himself was among the people. And Jesus, whenever he went back to heaven, when he ascended into heaven, he says, I shall send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can live in each and every one of us. But you have, to, you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. You, oh yeah, I went to church two or three times and didn't do any good. It's because your eyes are blinded. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you have God's Spirit living in you. You can think you do, but you don't. You can't. Jesus says, John 15, 5, you can do nothing without me. He's not saying that you can't walk and talk and work a job and do this, that, and the other. That's not what he's talking about. Those are physical, worldly things. He is saying you cannot see the kingdom of God and understand the kingdom of God unless you have the Holy Spirit living in you, unless you have God living in you. This is a profound statement. This is something that, the, that I don't hear a lot of the church is talking about. Yeah, they talk about, yeah, you got to be baptized. No, Jesus says you got to be born again. Big difference. You don't have to be, you don't have to be, that's not the right way I want to say it. You don't have to be in church to be born again. You don't have to be with a preacher, if you will, to be born again. You don't have to be with a group of religious people to be born again. You can be born again driving in your car going to work. You can be born again in the middle of the night when God wakes you up and says, Hey, buddy. You can be born again at any time. Because it has nothing to do with the flesh. It has to do with your very spirit. Jesus answered him when there was no question. He answered him. And he says, Surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I don't care how much you study your Bible. If you do not have the Holy Spirit leading you, guiding you, influencing you, you will not understand the scriptures. Jesus spoke in parables all the time, using something physical to teach something spiritual. And the, all the people, he said, I even do this so that the, I'm going to use it this way. He didn't say this in scripture, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it this way so the knotheads will think that they understand, but they don't. And it's the same way with us. We're not going to understand the messages that we, st that we study through the scriptures. We're not going to truly understand them and receive them unless we have God teaching us. Jesus says man will not teach man anymore. The Holy Spirit will teach you all truths. All truths. There is no way possible to really understand all that God is, much less understand his plan. We're going to jump over to 1 Corinthians 1. You can go there if you want to. If not, you just write it down and we'll, uh, you can go back and, and look it up. But 1 Corinthians, I'm just going to share it with you real quick. 1 Corinthians 1. Come on, fingers. 
18 through, uh, 18 through 31. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us, but to us, believers, true believers, who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dis uh, disputer of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the, this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, the stumbling block to the Greeks and uh, to foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You cannot understand the kingdom of God or really and truly anything about it other than very elementary things unless you have God living in your life. It is impossible. Again, Jesus says you can do nothing without me. It's very, very important that we understand we have to have God. We have to have God. It's not that it's a good idea. It's not that it's something that might work. We have to have God. Back over in John 3, verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I can just see Jesus going, Golly, what are you thinking, buddy? Are you serious? You're supposed to be the smart guy? And you're thinking that how can you enter your mother's womb? Again, he's living in the physical. He's... He's thinking the physical has nothing to do with the physical. It has to do with the spiritual has to do with the spiritual. Jesus goes on and says, he answers most assuredly. I say to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right. We've got, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. See how important being reborn is. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we must remember there's a kingdom on this earth. There is a kingdom in the celestial heavens. There's three heavens. And then there's a kingdom in the eternal heaven where God is at present. Where Jesus is seated right at the right hand of him right now. How far is that? It's way out there somewhere. It's one of the things that I don't understand. It's one of the things that's very hard to comprehend. But it is one of the things I believe. Why? Because God said it. I believe it because God said it. Not because I understand it. Not because I know it. Not because I've seen it. Not because I've been there. But because God says it is. And I believe God because his word is nothing but truth. There's no lie in God. There's no falsity. If falsity, is that a word? Sounds good to me. There's no falsity in God. God is nothing but truth. And his word is true. So we must understand that what God tells us is that you have to be born of the water and born of the spirit. Not the water as the amniotic fluid that I think he has, I said that right, that is in the womb but the water of the word, the washing of the word. What do you mean the washing of the word? How does the word wash us? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to go there real quick. You don't have to, but way back over in the Old Testament in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel. Whoops. Ezekiel 36, just write this down and stay with me for a second. Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 24, God says, For I will take you from among the nations, nations being the group of people. In other words, he will take you out of Kemp, Texas, if you will, out of Texas, out of the United States. In other words, he will take you into his self. 
I will take you from among the nations, gather you and all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you <clears throat> from all your filthiness and from all your idols. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm going to wash your sins away. This is God's word speaking to us. I will give you, <coughs> excuse me, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Bam! You get a new spirit. That's called the Holy Spirit. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of, of I mean, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I have given to your fathers. It's called heaven. It's called eternal heaven because they're there now. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all uncleanness. I will deliver you from all uncleanliness. In other words, to put it as we would understand it, his blood will wash your sins away. How about that? His blood will wash your sins away. In uh, 1 John 3 and 9, God's word tells us that we are without sin. How can that be? It's another one I don't quite understand. How can I be without sin when I know I still mess up? When I know I'm going to mess up again? What? Pastor, you sin? Yeah. My wife thinks I sin because I didn't put the toilet lid down. Well, to her, that's pretty bad. Ladies, y'all know what we're talking about. My point is, is that we all mess up. But God says... God says that I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness and I will call <clears throat> for the grain to multiply and it will bring no famine upon you. In other words, he's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. Philippians 4, I think it's 19, says God will provide all your needs according to riches and glory and for the glory of and according to riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He'll provide all you need. You're not going to be in need. God's got you. Now let's skip from there over in Ezekiel and let's go over to verse 36. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 36. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know. Now this is very important to understand. Then the nations all around you will see, I'm going to word it a little differently, will see the God in you. Then the nations which are left around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt in the ruined places and planted what is what was desolate I the Lord have spoken and I will do it wow what a promise thus says the Lord God I will also let the house of Israel require of me to do the inquire of me to do this for them and I will increase their men like a flock like a flock offered as holy scriptures the flock of Jerusalem and its feast days shall uh, so shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, God is simply saying, you come to me and I got you. And I'm going to wash you clean. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to prosper you. Doesn't mean he's going to give you all the money in the world. Doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery. It simply means that he's going to provide all that you're going to need. Because you're his. Why would a father not give their children all that they, that they need? Not want, but that they need. His promise is that. And then he says, and all the nations around you will see that I am God. Wow, you get to step out and people see the Jesus in you. How awesome is that? When I step out, they go, I know, I know you. Let's go do this and that. And that. Uh -huh. I've been changed. I don't do that stuff anymore. What? Give me a break. See, they don't believe it. Because they're not believers. But believe me, I think Cotton will attest. I know Cotton's sitting there thinking, man, I've lived that life. And now look what God. I'm thinking the same thing, brother. Look what God has changed in my life. 
Not how bad I was. I don't look back and reflect on that. I look, and look back and see how far I've come and what God has done in my life. And I pray you do the same thing. If we look back and see the things that we've done, we sit there, oh man, that's got to be depressing. But if we see what God has done for us and done with us and to us, what a glorious day. I am so thankful. Don't understand why, but I'm so thankful for what he did for me and for you. Why did he do it? Simple answer. He loves you. He loves you that much. We're going to see this next week. The whosoever's, right? Everybody goes, oh yeah, John 3.16. Not, we're not going there yet. All right, that's next week. We have to understand that God is for you, not against you. Period. Period. There's, no, there's nothing else to it. He is for you, not against you. He loves you. Over in... Uh, John 4, just flip the page over. You should be in John 3. John 4, starting at verse 13 and 14. Jesus tells the lady uh, at the well, he says, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. The natural, the flesh, the physical water that they were there at the well getting, right? But Jesus continued on. He says, but whoever drinks of the water Remember, you've got to be cleansed by the water and the spirit. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Wow. Amen, amen. I want a cup of that water. Matter of fact, I want a bucket. Matter of fact, I want a whole tub. Amen. And that's what it's all about. It's all about sharing that water. That's what Jesus did with her. He shared. He said, the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. Because you'll never sin again. Why? I don't understand that. What do you mean I'll never sin again? In your spirit, you will never sin again. Your spirit is made pure. That's what it tells us over in John 3, 1 John 3, I believe it's 19. You will never, your spirit will never sin again. It is made as pure as Jesus is pure. But you still got a soul. And you got a body that needs some work. Uh, it's 1 John 3, 9. I just saw it on my notes here. 1 John 3, 9. Your spirit is cleansed. It is completely cleansed. It is pure. God's word washes men's spirits washes men's spirits they are washed by the word of God at the moment of salvation Ephesians 5 and 26 tells us that he is mighty that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word the washing of the water by the word it's the word that cleanses you the word is Jesus. In Titus 3, 5, it says, Through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the word. Father God is the word. God is the word. It tells us over that in 1 John 1. 1 John 1, not 1 John 1. In the Gospel of John, verse 1, 1 through 18. Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. Father God is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Our triune God that we believe in. We don't understand it, but we believe it. And we receive it. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you must be reborn in your spirit by the Holy Spirit through the washing or by the learning of the truths of God through the learning power of the word of God. There is no other way to know God except through knowing his word, which is knowing Christ. You must know Jesus in order to know the word. Because Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus. Gospel of John 1 through 18. First verse one, chapter 1 verse 1 through 18. Back over to John 3. 
Jesus goes on to explain to Nicodemus, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is physical is physical. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's not talking about being born again in the, in the flesh, Nicodemus. There is no way you're going to go back into your mom's womb, nor would your mom allow you to do that. Are you kidding me? We must understood that Jesus always taught in parables. The parables is a physical thing to teach a spiritual lesson. Jesus uses something that, we, that everybody should understand. Many times during this region or during this period of time, it was an agri agricultural, talking about planting the seeds. It's something that people understood but it was not to teach about planting the seed in the ground as far as an actual seed. It is talking about planting a, a seed, the, the seed of the word, because the word tells us that the seed is the word. It tells us planting the word into the spirits of those who will receive the seed. It's not a physical, it's a spiritual. That's why we can dunk you a thousand times in that water and it does nothing except get you wet. Verse 7. He says, don't marvel at this. Don't be surprised at this. Don't be amazed by this. Don't go, wow. He says, you must be born again. You have to be born again. It is a process you must encounter. I didn't say it's a process you must go through. It is a happening in your life that you must encounter. Why? Because you're not going through anything. God does all the work. You don't have to do anything except... Yes, Lord Jesus, I receive you. And then the Holy, the Holy Spirit encounters or comes into your life. God does all the work. What do you got to do? Nothing except receive. And it's a free gift. It's a free gift of God. Ephesians 1, 9 through 14, I think it is, or 15. It is a free gift of God, guaranteeing your eternal life. You don't have to do anything except receive the gift. We're fixing to go into the Christmas season. Who wants a gift? I do, big and expensive. No, I don't. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I always tell my kids that because they are my gifts, and they're big and they're expensive. But they are my gift. And the only gift that I ever want to receive and I want them to receive is Jesus. The gift. The gift. Jesus says you must be born again. There is no other way except to be born again. So how, how do we know we're born again? How do we know? I mean, that is a big question, right? Oh, yeah, I'm born again. How do you know? Oh, yeah, well, you know, I got baptized 15 times. So I, I have to be born again. Well, how do you know? Well, my wife said I'm born again. My preacher said I'm born again. How do you know? Do you know I don't know if Terry's born again? What? Bear with me. Only her and God knows if she's born again. Only her and God truly know. She could have said, hey, I'm going to get this guy by saying I'm a Christian. And I can be easily fooled. It's happened before. In my heart of hearts, I know that she's born again. But that's between her and God only. She doesn't know if I'm born again. It's between me and God only. Only God knows my heart. She knows a lot about my heart, but she doesn't know my heart. Now, I guess that's kind of not true because she, she pretty well got me figured out. But nobody truly knows except you and God. Only you and God truly know. 
So how do others know? Well, I know Chris is born again. In my heart of hearts, I know he's born again. But only he and God actually know. But I know that he is because I have seen the work God has done in his life. And the work that God is doing in his life. You see, there's evidence. There's evidence. Over in the book of James. James says works without deeds. Oh, you mean we got to get works to be saved? No, 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 no. Not at all. We do the works because we've been saved. We do them out of it with an attitude of gratitude. We do them because we cannot understand why in the world God would save us, but he did, and so we want to please him in every way we possibly can. So we do the things that we do because of what he's done. Not that he'll do it again because it's already done. I've seen the evidence work in his life. I've seen the accident, uh, evidence work in Terry's life. I've seen the evidence work in many of your lives. Number 11 back there, boy, that's a big one, okay? I've seen the evidence of God working in his life. That's how people know you've been born again. It's because of your life. Now, again, we don't want to go back and look at the old life, all right? No, 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 no. That's my business. That's my private area. I go back there to say, oh, God, why did I do all that wasted time? But that's between me and God, see? But what I want to show you is what God's doing in my life now and what he's going to do in my life tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And the same thing, I want to see the evidence in you. We have to see that evidence. See, we're believing by seeing. Jesus says, oh, Thomas, blessed are those who see and believe, but more blessed are those who do not see and believe. So see, I take it on faith that Terry's saved. I know that she is in my heart. I take it on faith that Chris is saved. They take it on faith that I'm saved. Because we believe. Jesus goes on to explain this in the next verse. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound. But cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, we, we can't see the wind. We see the effects of the wind. You, you go, you drive by here on 274 and you see the flags waving, you oh, it's a windy day. You don't know that in your car when you're traveling 60 miles an hour because you have the wind rushing by you, right? But you see the flags moving, you see the trees swaying, you see the effect of the wind, but you don't see the wind. No one has ever seen the wind. Oh, well, I saw a tornado one time. You didn't see the wind. You saw the debris in the wind. You see, we, don't, we can't see the wind, just like we can't see the Spirit. But we can see the effects of the Spirit. We can see what the Spirit does as a reflection of what God has changed in my life. You can see the Spirit living through me. And I'm not boasting about me. I'm boasting about God living in me. Why would he live in this trash dump? I moved out of the projects whenever we were, we were young. I didn't want to live in the projects. God came to live in the projects. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done, all you will do. Because I have total confidence in God. We cannot see the Spirit except through the works of the individual that has the Spirit. That's how you recognize someone has been born again. If you're living the same old life that you lived two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, then you might want to question whether or not you've been saved. If there's not been a change in your life, here's the most simplest way to understand it. I taught sailors to cuss. My kids used to tell me, can you not say a sentence without a cuss word in it? This is a while back now. Wasn't yesterday. It's a long time ago. But they literally said, can't you not say a sentence without a cuss word in it? And of course, some explicits came out because that's who I was. And one day they told me, we like the new dad. 
We like the new dad. My heart was broken. So in other words, they didn't like the old dad. But they liked the new dad. You see, I want my kids to like me. I want them to love me. But if they live in fear, if they live in sorrow, if they live in hurt, if they live in pain, if they live in threats, how in the world are they ever going to love me? You see, I have to live in love for them, for them to feel comfortable enough to, to know that I truly love them. They have to see the evidence. And it's not something that I did. Only God can do that. But there has to be a change in your life. If you're living the same way day in and day out that you've been living for all your life, you might want to re-examine. Now, I'm not trying to judge anybody because there is no one who is more of a wretch than I am. But you need to examine. That's what Paul tells us over in 1 Corinthians uh, 11. He says you need to examine yourselves. We talked about this last week when we did this, the elements, partook in the Lord's Supper. Well, you need to examine yourself. Where are you with God? God is with you, but where are you with him? Are you, are you truly showing Christ's works through you? Or are you just saying, oh yeah, I'm one of those Christians. I go to church. You have to be Jesus to the world. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven. He is not here on this earth. The Holy Spirit is here on this earth living in each one of us in order to project the God to the other people. Jesus came for one reason, one reason alone. What was that reason? To let the world know God. He came so that the world would know God. Well, he is now seated at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven. That's what Scripture tells us. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. For why? So that we could let the world know God. You have, you have to be God. What? You know you're not God. And you know you're not Jesus and never will be. There's one Jesus, one God, one Holy Spirit, right? Scripture tells us that. But he lives in you. And so you have to show God to the world through you. Then the world will see that you are born again. There has to be proof. There has to be proof. Not so that God will believe. Do you think God believes in God? I think he does. I think he does. But does the world believe that God lives in you? It depends on whether or not you project God. It's that simple. And you cannot project God unless you are born again. Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, nor can anyone else see the kingdom of heaven in you. You cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, nor will you ever enter into the kingdom of heaven unless heaven is in you. Because wherever Jesus is, that's heaven. Do you realize that? Wherever Jesus is, there is heaven. Over in the book of Matthew, whenever he was teaching his disciples, he says, heaven is among you. Why? How? Because Jesus was there. Wherever God is, that's where heaven is. Wherever king is, that's where the kingdom is. Wherever the Lord is, that's where the lordship is. And if Jesus is living in you, then God is living in you. Then that's where heaven is living. Not dead, but alive. But alive. Nicodemus answered Jesus and he says, How can this be? I don't get it. How can all this happen? I don't understand this stuff. What did Jesus tell him earlier? Unless you have been born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, he's telling Nicodemus, look, you're the really smart guy. You are the Pharisee of Pharisees. You're the really, really brilliant guy. You're the leader, et cetera, et cetera, because he's going to bust his chops here in just a second. He says, you're the, you're the one that everybody looks up to, and yet you don't understand this. You and I cannot understand it either unless we have God. He says you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you have been born again. Unless you have the Spirit teaching you, guiding you, directing you. 
You cannot. Jesus says, you cannot do anything without me. Here's where he busts his chops. Jesus answers him and says, you're the teacher of Israel? Wait a minute. Nicodemus, you're supposed to be teaching all of God's people about God, and you don't understand this? You call yourself a teacher? Seriously? But yet you do not know these things. We must understand, people. We must understand. Unless you surrender to God, unless you have Christ living in you, you're not a Christian. Oh, you're trying to judge me now. No, not at all. Chris used this a couple of weeks ago. Christian is used three times in the New Testament, the word Christian. Christian means to be Christ-like. Who in here is like Christ? Ooh, I fall short. I fall short. Now, see, we don't, I don't, I don't, I don't compare myself to Cotton. Cotton doesn't prepare, uh, uh, compare himself to me. I don't compare myself to Chris. Chris doesn't compare himself to me. See, we have to compare ourselves to Jesus. And I fall way short. Way short. I got a long way to go. Philippians 1 6 tells us, though, that what God has started in you, He will bring to completion. So you see, I don't worry about it because I just know that God's carrying me through. But how's God going to carry me through if I'm not born again? If I don't have God, He's not going to carry you through. So you must be born again. It is, a, it is the requirement. Not born in the physical, born in the spirit. Born in the spirit. You must be born again. And Jesus, uh, God's go, Jesus is going to tell us next week between 11, and I know some of you are going to go ahead and read ahead. Oh, I know. Well, if you know, then you preach next week. Okay? You bring the message next week. Hey, I'll, uh, if you know it, I'll let you. We have to understand to know God is to love God and to love God, truly love God, is to understand the love of God. And God loves you. God wants to be a part of your life. But do you know you're, you're a powerful person? Do you know that? You're awesome. You're so powerful. You got so much strength. You can actually hold back God. That's not a fight I want to get into. Matter of fact, I know of a guy named Jacob who got into a fight with God and he twisted his hip to where he walked with a limp the rest of his life. I don't want to fight God. I would much rather just surrender to him and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. And let God come into my life, which he has already. But unless you're born again, you cannot know God. You can know of him. But you cannot know him. And Jesus says, if you have seen, the fa seen me, you have seen the Father. So if you have seen Jesus in your spirit, you have seen God. If you have Jesus in your spirit, you have God. Not only you have God, you sit there and think, oh, well, this person's going to come against me. Oh, well, you know, I can't believe all these people hate me. And oh, no, no. How can anybody do anything to you? You have the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus, the, the Son. And you have God, the Father, living inside of you. You have all three of them. That's four against one person. I love it where the Scripture says, what can mere man do to me? I don't worry about it. Because I got God. I use this term all the time. I ain't going to worry about it because God's got it. You see, this is what God tells us. He says, you know what? I love this. Word. It's over in uh, Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, what do you worry about tomorrow? Tomorrow's going to have enough problems of its own. You worry about today. And guess what? I'm going to get you through today. And then when tomorrow comes, I'm going to get you through that day. 
when the next day comes, I'm going to get you through that day. How many of you have ever said in your life at one time or another, for whatever reason, I just don't think I can make it? Guess what? You're still here. Okay? And as Christians, when we, our day comes, and it shall come, unless Jesus comes back and takes us all to be with him, when our day comes, guess what? Then we've really made it. We really have made it because then we're in heaven with George and Evelyn and other, our other George and all the other people that have gone before us. We get to see them again. Only if you have God. Why? Because Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into heaven. That's simple to understand, right? You'd have to get somebody else to help you not understand that. If you are not born again, you cannot enter into heaven. Jesus lays a narrow road that leads to the gate of heaven. It's not a wide road. It's a narrow road. And he says many, many will not find it because they're on the wide road. But straight and narrow is the road that leads to the gates of heaven. What is that road? That road is to be born again. Because that is the gate to heaven. To be born again. How do you do that? You do it sitting right where you're at. Those of you who are watching on TV throughout the world. You do it right where you're sitting right now. This is how you do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it so easy that you would have to get a whole herd of people to, to just totally confuse you to where you won't understand it. Because it's so very simple. Jesus says, I live, so you too shall live. All you have to do is receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Well, that's too easy, Pastor. That's too easy. That's how easy it is. But the alternative is, is going to be very, very difficult. If you do not receive Christ, you will not enter the gates of heaven. That's what Jesus said. How simple is that? Do we believe the truths of God? That's a question. Yes, yes. yes we do. The truth of God says, we just read it. You must be born again in order to see, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to give you that invitation right now. Go ahead and come on up, sister. I'm going to give you that invitation right now. The invitation is, is to simply receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. How do you do it? It's too simple. But it is simple. You simply ask Jesus to come. You ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. How hard is that? All together, I would like for us all to say, if you're a Christian, if you don't feel like you should say it, then you might want to think about it. But I want us all to say just simple words. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. That's it. That's it. No big thing. But here's the key. You must mean it. You must mean it in your heart. Not so that your wife can hear you so she'll feed you this afternoon. Okay. I know, I know. All right, you don't, you don't have to do it so that you can impress somebody else. You do it so that Jesus, you don't even have to do it out loud if you don't want to. You can do it in your heart, in your chair, silently by yourself. It's a secret, remember? It's a secret. <coughs> Dear Jesus, don't want anybody else to see. See, this is what Nicodemus is doing. I don't want anybody else to see me. I don't want anybody else to hear me say, oh, Jesus, please come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Don't do that. Shout it to the heavens. Shout it to the heavens. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus, come into my life. I need you as my Lord and my Savior. I want you as my Lord and my Savior. Save me. When Peter was sinking in the water, when he had stepped out of the boat, what did he shout? Oh, you guys stole me a lightsaber. No. He shouted to Jesus and he said, save me. He stuck his hand up and scripture says Jesus reached down and pulled him up. That's exactly what Jesus does to us. He reaches, us, reaches down and he grabs your hand 
And he pulls you into the comfort of God. He pulls you into the presence of God. Why? Because we're all sinking. We're sinking to the depths of hell unless we have Christ. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, if there's anybody here, to know, here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior of their life, I pray for you, not for any benefit of anybody else, but the benefit of you, that you call on Jesus' name. The word says, call on his name and you shall be saved. I pray that you will humble yourself to the point that you simply say, dear Jesus, mean it in your heart. You have to mean it. You have to truly mean it. God knows your heart. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I shall follow you the rest of the days of my life. Guide and direct me for your good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That's how simple it is, friend. It is that simple. And Jesus promises you, all that shall call on his name shall be saved. So if you said that prayer and you call on his name, God says... You are now saved. Tomorrow when you wake up, you'll see that same face in the mirror. <laughs> you may be scared. You may go, oh no, what happened? It didn't take. No, it's what happens on the inside that took. And it has taken according to the word. And you are now a child of the Most High God. And I pray that that is so in your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody who needs prayer, let's uh, come up and let's pray for you.